it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Yihan Shao. Um, Yihan got his uh, bachelor's in chemistry at Nanjing University in, in China uh, and did a thesis on trivalent polyhedral clusters. He then went on to get his PhD in theoretical chemistry uh, here at the University of California at Berkeley with Professor Martin Head Gordon. And there he did, he did a thesis on uh, linear scaling methods in density functional theory. Uh, after um, graduating from Berkeley, he got a job here at QChem and he worked here for 14 years actually, uh, starting off as a staff scientist, uh, then becoming a senior scientist, and finally the principal scientist and head of developer relations here at, at QChem. And I know that uh, QChem as an organization is extremely fortunate to have Yihan's expertise and hard work. Um, uh, since then, uh, Yihan has um, been a co-author on scores of publications and has had nearly 6,000 citations. It's an extremely impressive body of work. Uh, now he is a professor at the University of Oklahoma and his research interests are in enzymatic and catalytic reactions um, and excited state processes such as bioluminescence and chemiluminescence. From a theoretical perspective, this means multi-scale QM-MM methods and polarizable force fields. He's gonna to talk to us today about a few hidden features in QChem that sound really interesting on a variety of topics. I will turn it over to Yihan and remember to submit your questions. Go ahead. Hi, Andrew. Thank you for the very nice introduction and uh, thank you, Zen Team, for hosting this webinar. In the audience, I see quite a few old friends and uh, a lot of new friends. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, some features in QCAM and uh, many of them has been there for a number of years, but uh, we did not uh, advertise them that much and uh, there are, and then I will also talk about some new features. The four features I will cover, the first one will be potential energy scan, the second one will be ESP charges, the third one will be decomposition of TDFT exciting energies, and the fourth one will be multiple environment single system QMM. So all features are available in QCAM 5.1. And I will end telling you a little bit about what exactly we are working on in my group. So let's, let me start with the potential and skin. And this feature has been implemented for a number, um, for a number of years and it's included in the QCAM manual. So, and, uh, so if we want to run this calculation, the only thing we have to do is to change the job type to PS scan. And then what we need to add here is a scan input section. Suppose we have a molecule, butane here, and then there are four carbons, one, two, three, four. We want to see how the potential energy change with the torsional angle for associated with these four carbon atoms. And what we do there is to edit in the scan session is to have the torsion angle and then we specify the four atoms associated with this torsion angle and the initial value for the torsion angle and the final value and finally is the increment. So we go from minus 180 degree to 180 degree with 15 degree increment. So altogether there'll be 25 points. By the way that uh, when we do the putting and scan we're not limited to torsional angles. We can also do bone lenses, bone angles and, and the initial value here, 180, minus 180 is smaller than 180, but uh, you can have a higher initial value than the final value. And uh, we also allow two dimensional scans. Here we have one dimensional one, and, but we can have two dimensional scans where we can combine one torsion, one stretch, for example, or two, two bonus stretches. And if we run that calculation, and uh, either either by typing the input or by using IQMOL, and then we will get uh, the output. And here, the, and then we can use IQMOL and uh, to visualize this uh, this calculation results. So this is thanks to Andrew Gilbert, who 
who make this happen. So if we use IQ mode, and what we see here is that this is our scan angles from minus 180 to 180 with 15 degree increment. And we see that there are three local minimum. And at minus 180, minus 60, and 60 degrees. And then there are three maximums at a zero, minus 120, and a plus 120 degree. And overall, the energy range is about 0 .0, 0 0.08 Hartree, and that's about 5 kilo more. So this is torsional potential of butane, and uh, we get it with a single uh, calculation. Essentially, what we are doing here is that for each of these angles, we do a constraint minimization. So we, we, we fix the torsion angle at here at minus 120 degree, and we optimize geometry, and, and that this, then we get this energy. So this is what we typically call a relaxed planar scheme, namely for that particular degree frame, at that particular value, we will do a constraint minimization. But there are cases that we might want to do so-called frozen planar scan, namely that we just change the degree freedom, say that a bond length and bond angle, but we leave all the other degree freedom fixed. And so that would be a frozen scan. For example, here I have a methanol molecule, and what I'm doing here is to stretch this CO bond from 1.0 astron to 2.0 astron with 0.5 astron increment. So that give me three points. And so the only thing we do differently in this calculation is to add the frozen scan true into the RAM section. And, uh, and so the only thing we do here is to take the current geometry and compute the energy. So the, and you notice that I have a Z matrix uh, input here for the geometry, and that's required if we want to do frozen scan. And uh, actually the degree of freedom we want to scan must be included in the initial Z matrix. So that's the limitation of this uh, frozen planar scan. And uh, so this is relaxed and uh, frozen planar scan, but uh, recently there are uh, more features that we can use to uh, do planar scan. And, uh, and uh, suppose we have a reaction, CH3Cl interacting with Cl minus. And uh, we, what we want to do is to define a reaction coordinate. And as we all know, for this kind of SN2 reaction, the most natural reaction coordinate would be the distance but the difference between two distances, the first distance is the distance between C1 and C2, uh, and chlorine 2, and the second distance would be carbon 1 and uh, chlorine 6. So we have these two, dis two distances, and we take a difference. And we, what we want to do is to, to find an energy uh, for that particular uh, reaction coordinate, R12 minus R16, at a particular value. So say that. It, and uh, suppose that we want to scan this reduction coordinate from minus two to 2.0. And what we do is to, is to add a new input section into the called scan into the input file. And the first character there will be R12 minus R34. So, and so namely, meaning that this reduction coordinate here, and then we, we set, then we name the two atoms associated with the first distance and then the two atoms associated with the second distance and we have initial value, final value, increment. And there is one more value here, which is the fourth concept, the K value here. So really what we are doing here is to apply a harmonic potential to bias the uh, geometry optimization such that the reaction coordinate roughly takes the kernel value of the R. So and so so so, so what does this this do is to do a series of restrained geometry optimization and the, the restraint at each each value of r is this harmonic potential, and uh, currently it only supports one dimensional scan, and uh, so in this particular case we have r12 minus r16, but we can also in, in some particular cases we can use r12 plus. R34. So that option is also there. And for, for this reaction, SN2 reaction, if we run the calculation, what we get? 
is this planar surface from IQMO, <coughs> which we can got from IQMO. So we can see that there are two minimum, and uh, so where that the uh, the difference between the two this uh, two um, bond lenses C C12 and C16 will be minus 1.2 and uh, plus 1.2 astrom, and in between there's barrier, and the barrier is about 0.01 heart rate, or that's about six or seven kmo. So, and of course, the, the reason we do this is that when we have we have a chemical reaction, and then the highest energy point along we got from this skin, we can use it to to for further training state search. And uh, so if we don't want to do the entire panel scan, say that I just want to get at the middle point, and we can just do a single uh, restrained geometry optimization. And the, the way we do that is to do change job type to opt, and then we use opt two section to do the geometry constraint. A restraint. So we have the so again we have the R12 minus R34, the four atoms associated with this restraint, the current of value for the restraint and the force constant. So this will be single um, uh, geometry optimization with a restraint. So this is the first feature uh, that I think it can be useful for many uh, uh, research, especially that for chemical reaction studies or or when we simply want to do a Panela scan to develop force field parameters. Okay, that's the first uh, feature. The second feature is the electrostatic potential derived charges. And as you all know, that the QCAM offers many, many charge populations. And we, in the, when we run QCAM job, we always see milligram charges printed in the output file. And we also know that milligram charges can be problematic because when we have large large basis sets with diffuse functions, the values can go crazy, can get a non-physical. And we also have MBO charges, QCAM supports both MBO5 and MBO6. And, but there are other charges that are also available. And uh, so for example, Chop G charge is, uh, is also electrostatic potential derived charge. And uh, that, was developed, that was put up by John Herbert's group and it and, and uh, as the electrostatic this der potential derived charge that will reproduce, for example, the dipole moment, it's also very stable with space stats. And uh, so in general, that with ESP charges, the main trouble is that when we have large molecules, then and we will see that what we try to do is to reproduce electrostatic potential on some surface points. And uh, when we have large molecules, that can become a problematic because the charges of the inner uh, atoms can become underdetermined. So then we have been uh, so looking at other charge populations. For example, we can use Hertzfeld charges, and uh, that's in QCAM is originally developed by uh, Troy van Mars group, and recently we have another implementation from John Herbert's group. But the, and so there we simply use atomic charges to to, to as weight functions to, to find the uh, atomic uh, atomic charges in a molecule. The main trouble there with Hertzfeld charges is that they are usually too small. And to fix that, there are two uh, ways to fix that in QCAM. The first one is called a CM5 charge model. That's called charge model five. That's what developed by Don Truller group at the University of Minnesota. And uh, that, that is used in, for example, the SM12 solvation model. But uh, another implementation is also available in QCAM by John Herbert's group. And the only thing we have to do there is to put a CM5 called true in the, in the input file. Another way to correct the, uh, the systematic error in Hertzfeld charges is to use, to use the so-called iterative Hertzfeld scheme. And the, the, the way we, we, to invoke that calculations to put a Hertz iteration equal true in the input file. And in general, that both CM5 and iterative Hertzfeld charges are much better than Hertzfeld charges. And uh, if you want to know a, more about these charges, you can read one, one of my papers published back in 2015. Okay, now to back to uh, our charges, the ESP and uh, charges. And uh, what, uh, what the only thing we have to do is to, in the input file, at ESP underscore charge to be one or two. And uh, we, if we use one, so then we, and a two, we have different uh, group uh, points for uh, computing the electrostatic potential. So if we use one, 
So, so really, what we are doing here is to build a, to start with many wall surfaces. So, for each atom, there is many walls, red eye, and then we, and then we have many walls, red uh, uh, surface for the entire molecule. We actually have four layers of many wall surface at a different uh, many walls, red eye. So, 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 so the first surface will be Benoit's red eye multiplied by 1.4 and 1.6, then 1.8, then 2.0. We have four layers of Benoit surfaces, and we put grid points on the on the Benoit surface, and we have two schemes to decide where to put those surface points. We can either use spherical harmonics, that's option number one, or we can use lepidic points, that's option number two. And the lepidic points is also used in normal TFT, normal DFT calculation. That's how we do the exchange correlation part of the DFT calculation. And a different option is to use, rather than have ESP charges, a keyword, we use the desk charge keyword, and you will see the effect of doing that in a couple minutes. So, and so, so if we uh, run the calculation, and what I have here is a ethanol molecule, CH3, CH2OH, and if we put uh, this keyword in, in the input file, in the RAM section, and uh, so this is what we say. So this is very much like Mutican charges in, in terms of format, and uh, so we all have it, it, the charge values on every atom, and for example, this hydroxyl oxygen has electric charge minus 0.67, and the hydrogen on the hydroxyl is hydrogen is 0 0.40. And so, and in general, so as this is what we see, and these charges, like the charge charges, they will reproduce the uh, the total dipole moment of the molecule. For example, if we take these charges and compute the dipole moment from these charges, we get a dipole moment 1.6305 the pi, and the actual uh, dipole moment for this molecule at this level of zero is 1.6239. So we can see that ESP charges in general will reproduce the uh, dipole moment of molecule. That's why they use, for example, in amber force field. If we use a, a different grid points, so on the left we have a sphere harmonics, and then on the right we have left 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 points, and then the charts on a slide different, and uh, so so you just have two different options, and uh, so if we put the rest of the charges to be true, and uh, so this is uh, on the right I have rest of the charges, and on the left I have yes charges. What do we see that now that the three hydrogens on the methyl group have the same charges. So really, we restrain the charge in the fitting process. What we're trying to do is to have restrain that the the three hydrogens have the same charge. The same applies to the the hydrogen charges in the CH2 group. Oh, I forgot to say that in the ESP charges calculation, what we are trying to do is to compute the electrostatic potential on all those grid points. And uh, so that has two contributions from the from all the nu nuclear and from the electron density. And then what we're trying to do is to find a set of charges that best reproduce the electrostatic potential on these hundreds of thousands of points. And uh, then the in the, the only difference between ESP charge and SP charge is that whether we restrain the uh, the chemical equivalent atoms have to have the same charge. So this is ESP charges for ground state, and we can also do excited state population. So, so this is I have for Mordechai molecule here, and uh, so and I'm running a, a TDDFT calculation. So I have RPA equals equal two, meaning that this is a, this is full TDDFT calculation. I'm asking for three single those are three single excited states using this particular functional and basis. And if we use put a population underscore mutican equals minus one here, that will give us mutican charge not only for the ground state, which we always get, but it also give us mutican charges for the excited states. That was coded up by John Herbert's group. And uh, but uh, but if we also add ESP underscore charges to be, to be one here, then we get the ESP charges for the excited state wave function two. The only thing I have to mention here is that we have to shoot at this line two, which is CIS relaxed stands to be true. What does that give us is that we 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 ask QCAM to give us the relaxed density for all the excited states, which 
in addition to the to to, to the normal contribution from amplitudes, there is also a contribution from the so-called z vectors. And exactly the next density or excited states is what the the external environment sees. So, and so this is the uh, output from from our high uh, calculation. And uh, so this is the ESP charges for the ground state wave function, and then and then after that we have the ESP charges for the three lowest singlet excited states. And uh, so the first, so we have four atoms, so there will be four rows, and then each column will be different uh, singlet excited state. And on the left, we don't have the, don't in, uh, this is unrelaxed density, and on the on the right we have the relaxed density. You can see the values are quite different. Again, we should use the value that corresponds to the relaxed electron density. And uh, suppose you want to look at the charge transfer going from ground state to excited state. We should, but you should, we should use the uh, the relaxed charge, uh, the ESP charge corresponding to the relaxed density. Or if we want to do the the force field parameters, we should also use uh, the relaxed density when we do the uh, that's charge fitting. Okay, so this is a second uh, feature that I think will be might be useful to uh, many users. And the third feature I want to talk about is, is the decomposition of TDDFT excitation energies. And so, and uh, so in my group uh, we do a lot of TDDFT calculation, and many of you know that uh, in TDDFT calculations, so what we are really doing is to solve this. So I what I call ABBA equation. We so we really have a generalized uh, eigenvalue problem. We try to diagonalize this ABBA matrix. If you want to know more details, you can read, for example, the paper by Sokirata and Martin Head Gordon back in 1999. And uh, so we diagonalize this matrix. So we get the exciting energy, which we call the vertical exciting energy. So this x and y values are called amplitudes. And then we and we can write this vertical excitation energy delta E into two terms. The first one would be a, a, I would call it a one electron term, which really come, depends only on the orbital energy differences. So here EIs will be the orbital energies of the occupied orbitals, and then the EAs will be the uh, orbital energies for the unoccupied orbitals, and, and then we have uh, the the uh, the square of the amplitudes. So this is the one electron term, totally depends upon the orbital energy difference. And it'll be the two electron terms. There'll be a Coulomb term, there'll be a change term, and there'll be a change correlation term. We're going to see the Coulomb term and a change correlation term in one minute. And uh, so, so we have implemented this in QCAM, and you're, in the next slide you are going to see how we can invoke this feature. And uh, so in general, it works for pure and hybrid Functionals, it works for restricted and unrestricted calculations, it works for singlet and triplets, and but for range separate functionals at this moment, you know, only works for two uh, range separate functionals, omega B97 X dash D and LRC omega P D H, the first one from from, from Jim Dache and Martin Gordon, the second one is from John Herbert. Internal basis, and if we have Cartesian basis meaning that 60 functions, 10 F functions, the numbers are exactly right. And if we use pure basis, meaning that I have five D functions and uh, seven F functions, like CCPVTZ, CCPTZ, the result is slightly off. You might be off by 0.0001 UV. So I'm, I still need to find a time to, uh, to fix that. In general, the decomposition of the uh, exciting energy, can, if you are interested in more details, you can read, for example, our uh, 2010 paper in molecular physics that's on the electrical gradient of TDDFT uh, energy. So, so if we want to uh, decompose TDDFT exciting energy, the only thing we have to do is to add two lines into the uh, RAM section. The first one is called CIS underscore dynamic underscore memory. And uh, so I want to set it to be false. Really that the current implementation of TDDFT is a that is, is a more advanced version could have uh, could have by my colleague uh, Zixiang Yu who is in the audience and uh, and, uh, and if we wanted to uh, decompose the time dependent density functional theory and energy we have to use the older version of, of QCAM 
and uh, so I need to find time to uh, to to implement it within new framework. And but so so and then so this is the first line we need to add, and the second line is the main line. So excite underscore energy underscore components to be true. And if we add those lines into the uh, QCAM input file, and if we run the calculation, in this case for motor high TDFD calculation, we're looking at the three uh, lowest excited uh, states. And we'll find that, uh, and so we'll find that the first state will be triplet, and the, uh, the third state is a singlet. And the both go involve the transition from D8, that's homo, to V1, that's normal. So the, this both involves homotonal excitation with the amplitudes very close to one. And uh, so if, if we can look at the output and we find that a vertical excited energy for the triplet excited state, lowest interesting triplet excited state is 2.147 UV, and the lowest singlet excited state has a, has a vertical excited energy of 2.87 UV. So, and then we can we can decompose the excited energy into one electron and two electron components. And then the one electron components are those red numbers. If add them together, we get 9.62 EV. And that's for the triplet. And if we add that for the singlet, we get 9.43 EV. That's very close to the homonormal gap, which is 9.28 EV if we subtract a normal homo from a normal. So, and so, the, so, so really that is a one electron contribution to, to the vertical excited energy is very large. It's far larger, the seven, seven UV larger than actual excited energy. Of course, that the cancellation comes from the two electron terms, the, the Coulomb exchange and exchange correlation terms. So, 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 so in TDFD calculations, this is, this is really, I mean, the energy decomposition analysis, this decomposition of the TDFD vertical excited energy is really a good uh, tool for us to, uh, to educate our students and postdocs, and so to, for them to be able to understand what the TDFD calculations are. So, so TDFD energy has so, so really it's not just the one electron contributions. If we have, it's really a detailed cancel balance between the one electron and the two electron contributions. The two electron contributions will, have, will cancel the one electron contributions to lower the vertical side energy to the correct value. And uh, so this is this also important of practically suppose you want to look at the homonormal gap or want to use that gap to guide the development of new chromophores or fluorophores. You have to worry about that the, this cancellation between the one electron two electron terms. And uh, so because if we just look at one electron term, you are significantly overestimating the exciting energy. Okay, so and uh, so. This is about uh, about the one electron and two electron terms, and then we can ask again for um, educational purposes, and then we will see that there is a singlet, which has an exciting energy of 2.87 UV, and we have triplet 2.14 UV. Why is this the singlet is like 0.7 UV higher than the triplet? And if we can look at all the different energy terms, we find that the largest difference. So we can find that the one electron term is pretty much as a, the same, and the the the, the two the main difference is the two electron term. The actually the cool what I the G two the Coulomb term, the because that for triplet this Coulomb term is zero. We're going to come to say why that's zero in one minute, and uh, but the but but the Coulomb term for, for the the two electron Coulomb term is is non-zero. It's positive. 0.6 EV for singlet. That's the main reason why that the singlet. Uh, exciting energy is, is, is 0.7 UV higher than the triple exciting energy. Really, this Coulomb term is, 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 is comes from the transition density for these uh, excitations. It's really the self-interaction energy between the uh, for, for, for the transition density. And uh, so if we have a triplet excitation, the alpha transient density would be exactly the opposite of the beta transient density, meaning that have a, have a, it's, off, it's different by one minus one sign. So in the end of the transient density is zero for triplet, triplet excitations. That's why this quantum term is zero for a triplet excitation. And then, so many times that when we run TDFD calculation, the, the number one thing we have 
choice we have to make is what function do we use? Do we want to use a standard functional like basal lip PV0, or we want to use a range separate functional like omega P9 semi or can basal lip or BNL? And uh, they will give us different uh, exciting energies. For example, if we, uh, for the same molecule, if we use basal lip, we get 2.84 EV. And if we use omega P9 and CFHD, we get 2.8. 7 EV is 0 0.3, 0 0.03 EV higher. This is for valence excited states. If for, for charge transfer state, the difference will be much, much larger. So omega P97 X dash D excited energy could be much higher than B3 level excited energies. And, and then we can look at the main differences between uh, all the energy components when we go switching from B3 functional to omega P9 omega B9 D functional. And the main difference comes from the exchange terms. And uh, so the one electron term, the one electron exchange term goes from eight, four UV to eight UV. So that's increase of four UVs and the two electron exchange term is decreased by 0.39 UV. So in the end, that the one electron term increase more than the two electron term and then that in, needed to a net increase of the uh, uh, total vertical excitation energy. So this, uh, this, uh, this uh, exchange terms, these two electron exchange terms are really that the interaction between detachment density and attachment densities. And if we have B3 level functional, we have so-called 25% hydrophobic exchange, and but when we have omega B97 dash D, we separate these uh, into two terms. There is a long range uh, exchange term, hydrophobic exchange term, and then the short range hydrophobic exchange term, and then the short range exchange term has a weight of 0.22, and we have 100% of hydrophobic long range exchange. And uh, so, 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 so anyway, we have increased. Of, uh, of the hydrophobic exchange going from PB0 to omega B97 D, that's why that the, the y electron exchange term increased from B3 to omega B97 D, and, and the in terms of absolute values that, uh, that the two electron exchange terms also increases. And, uh, and and so so overall, if we look at uh, the look at the, look at this uh, the change between PB uh, PB3 Vertical excited energy and omega and activity energies. So really, it's not the reason that we have the uh, vertical excited energy increase, not because of two electron terms. So the two electron terms, we're, we're actually, if we switch to range separate functionals, if we just have two electron terms, then the, the, the way, the, actually the energy will go down. It's only because the when we increase the, the long range hydrophobic, in, it increases the the homonormal gap. So if we, if we look at the homonormal gap for B3 lip functional, it's 5.5, it's, it's 5.4 EV. And when we use omega B 97X dash T functional, that's increased to 9 EV. So really, the main reason that when we have increase in the vertical set energy, especially for changes in the first state, is because the increase of the homonormal, homonormal gap or the optical energy differences. And that get canceled partially by the two electron terms. So, and uh, of course, that if we just if we, if we run ATDFT calculation, we get a ten uh, different excited states. Suppose the two uh, the ten lowest single excited states. We can actually look at this K two term, and uh, because that this is the interaction between the detachment uh, detachment density, and if 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 the, the detachment density and uh, it's very far away from the attachment density, that we are going to have a charge transfer excited state, and uh, and, uh, and 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 then uh, this, so when there is, and and then this value will be much smaller in terms of the absolute uh, uh, value. So basically, we, we can look at look, look at these values and then determine whether we have a charge transfer state or balance excited state. Okay, so this is the uh, this is a third topic. I should move fast. I just want to quickly mention that uh, one feature we have been working on the uh, in the last couple of years, which we call multiple environment single system QMMM methods. And uh, so, and uh, so in short, is MESS. Many people don't like the name. So what it really do 
is that we look at the, the special case of QM where that we have fixed QM region, so namely that we have fixed geometry for the QM and uh, for the QM region. Suppose we have a methanol molecule, we want to fix all the bond lenses angles and dihedral angles. And what we want to do is put this fixed QM molecule into a many, many different MM environments. So with the with with as, as we all know that when we run density functional theory calculation, then what we need to do is to find the best set of occupied orbitals to fill to 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 for for the all the electrons, and then depending upon the MMA environment, which is usually described by point. Uh, point charges and sometimes point dipoles and quadruples too. And, and within different MM environments, we have a different sets of molecular orbitals. In schematically, we say that uh, we, we have different minimum on, 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 the, on the surface with respect to the electron degree of freedom. And the question is that how you, in condensed phase calculations, and, and especially when we try to, for example, to compute the solvation of energy of a very rigid solid molecule, and then we do have a very rigid solid molecule and with, with the solid solvent molecules floating around. And how do, and we have many, many different uh, MM environments, many times probably millions of at least the hundreds of thousands of environments, sometimes millions of environments. How do we get the energy of those different uh, uh, configurations very quickly? And uh, we have a very simple idea, namely that we assume that uh, the potential energy surface with respect to the electron degree of freedom is indeed, indeed a quadratic function. And then we compute the, the curvature for, for the surface for a reference environment. It could be gas phase or could it be the, the first MMA environment you run into, or could it be just an average MMA environment? And then we compute the curvature for that or hashing for that environment for the reference structure and the voice environment. We we look at the gradient, and then we and then we take a one Newton reference step, and we get the the, the change in the in the electron degree freedom, and uh, in one shot we get uh, to the minimum and to get uh, to get uh, to very close to the optimized orbitals for the particular MMA environment. And uh, we can use, the, we have been, we have used this method to compute solvation of energies, which I'm going to show you in the next couple of slides. And we are working on to, to, to really accelerate the, uh, the calculation of enzymatic reaction free energy profiles. And it's also useful for us to figure out the, uh, how to parameterize um, for the force fields. And if you are interested in more details, we published three papers on the, on the subject and they are listed here. Here, I just want to show you how we can use the idea, the mass QMM method to speed up solvation of energy calculation. I have, um, I have a bunch of molecules that looks pretty rigid. And then we, uh, the, the way we compute solvation for energy for, or actually in this particular case, hydrogen for energy, namely the and free energy cost of transferring any of those molecules from gas phase into a water soft environment is we use the, we will use explicit solvent models. In, pre, in the particular case, particular case, we use the TP3P model to describe the water molecules. Namely, that it's a three-point model that we have a, a liquid charge on oxygen and two positive charges on hydrogens. And then the first step is we use molecular mechanics to compute hydrogen for energy. We run molecular dynamics. We put the solute into a box of 1,500 plus water molecules. We run molecular dynamics and get a canonical ensemble. And then, and, and, and then we compute the interaction between the solid and solvent molecules. And then from that, we get hydrogen for energy at the molecular mechanics level. At that point, that the solid molecules also described by molecular mechanics, so namely ball and stick models. And if we're not sure about the results, we can do QMM correction, and we cannot afford to do uh, uh, to, to, to compute energy for millions of, uh, of configurations, then we cheat. What we do is to 
collect a selected frames from the MM trajectory and say that tens of thousands of frames from the MM trajectory. And for those MM frames, we compute the QMM energy and use those energies and do so-called energy weighting calculation, get the QMM correction. And I wouldn't go into details, and I would just want to say that this calculation, this two-step two calculation, the MM stage of calculation is reasonably cheap. It take for depend upon the depend upon how big your water box is, and how many water molecule you have, and what a, what a, what a water model you have for, for the for the for the water molecules, and it takes roughly 100 CPU hours. If we want to do the QM correction, if we do the the most straightforward thing like 61 G star with B super functional, and we, that would take probably 400 to 2700 CPU hours. So the QM correction part is about four to 27 times more expensive. And if we use our mass QMM idea, so namely do this, uh, do this uh, Newton Raphson uh, uh, um, and, and correction, and and the, the, that would lower the uh, computer cost from 400 to 7 CPU hours. So that's about 50 times uh, faster. And uh, so again, we are assuming that the solid takes a rigid geometry, and the error we make. Compared to uh, compared to we we fully converge the orbitals at each environment the error is less than 0.2 kilo mole so pretty much we get the same answer at a, a, a two orders a magnitude a faster uh, calculation. And so let's look at the results. If we compute, uh, compute the free energy, uh, hydrogen free energy for those molecules, and you just using the, uh, doing, with step one, just do MM sampling, and that the error will be roughly 1.8 hypermole, that's in terms of root mean square error. And if we use BLIP functional, and uh, so, so the, the, what they are doing there is to, so I forgot to mention that. So when we do the QM correction, the solid molecule will become the QM region, and the MM region will be the, all the water molecules still described as a tip slippy model. So and if we if we apply B lip functional on the QM region, that's our solid molecule, the Riemann square error is now 1.07 given more. That's com that's very close to the chemical accuracy that uh, we want from uh, from a uh, a calculation, a quantum mechanical calculation like this. If we increase the, uh, if we use better functionals like B0, P0, or MO62X, or we get an density, that become increasingly more and more uh, expensive. MO6 is more expensive, B0 and PV0, omega PV0 density is also more expensive than two functionals. We see that the error increases. So in this particular case, we see that in, when we do QMM, when we when we use better functionals for the QM region, actually they needed to worse the results. That does not mean that uh, these functionals are wrong. So this what do these functionals do is to give us a better distribution of the internal degree of freedoms within the QM region, but that's not enough. In QM, QM calculations, we care equally about the interaction between the QM region and the MM region. And there we have two, two kinds of interactions. One is electrostatics. The QM electron density interacts with the uh, MM point charges and dipoles. The second one is actually van der Waals interaction. What, when, we, when we use uh, more surface functionals in the QM region, that, in, that improves the electrostatic component of the of the interaction between QM and MM region, but uh, we haven't done anything in my calculation. We haven't done anything with the Van der Waals interaction. So if we just uh, increase, the, just improve the uh, QMM electrostatics, is not sufficient. We also needed to worry about the QMM and Van der Waals, and that's something that we are working on. And uh, I'm close. So, okay, I have a couple minutes left. I just want to tell a little bit of. Uh, in general, what, what my group is interested in. So, so in general, we are working. We are interested in uh, two sides. One is one is theory and software development. Of course, that's a natural uh, continuation of what I have been working on at QCAM. And so there, they, we want to develop more accurate methods. We 
want to make existing methods more affordable, and we also want to make uh, um, the, the good methods more accessible and more usable by the general community. And uh, we also work on applications, namely chemical and biological applications. And there, we, what I say that we work on the three E's. The first E is stands for excited state processes, namely fluorescence and bioluminescence. And the second E stands for enzymatic and catalytic reactions. So, and the third E is energetics of solvation and binding. I already talked about the solvation a little bit today, but we are also looking at the binding processes, namely the binding of the light and the receptor. And uh, so, you know, so in general, what we are interested in is that we have a chemical, uh, we have a key region, which could be a chromophore or fluorophore, we could be a reaction site, or it could be the, uh, the solute plus the, the nearby solvent molecules, it could be the ligand plus the nearby protein residue. Atoms. And as we have, a, we have a key QM region, what I'm interested in is that how the electron structure of this Q, the Q region get perturbed by various different factors. We can do chemical perturbations, we can put it, the region in different solvents or macromolecular environments, or sometimes we just apply different quantum chemistry methods on, on, on this Q region. So we are really trying to understand how these different perturbations changes the electron structure. Actually, we are working, we, we, we have made a lot of progress to be able to understand the substitution effects on the on the chromophore and uh, and uh, and a fluorophore uh, absorption and exciting energies and uh, hopefully I'll be able to tell you more details in a later seminar. So with that, I want to uh, I want to thank many many people. Of course, that uh, I, I want to first I want to thank the QCAM team and I worked with the greatest scientists, the great competition competition quantum chemists in the world, and uh, so. Uh, Zenting, and I worked with Zenting for many, more than 10 years, and uh, Andrew and uh, Zichang I have working with, and Evgeny uh, I have worked with all of them for more than 10 years, and uh, and it's great that we have uh, Zenting and Andrew join us recently, and uh, I, during my uh, years at uh, KCAM I was helped tremendously by Mary Sue and Hillary. Of course, I want to thank the the QCAM board of directors and uh, Peter, who is in the audience, and uh, and uh, Martin and John and Anna and Fritz. Uh, I learned a, a lot from from, from uh, the QCAM board uh, board members and uh, and uh, so for the geometry optimization part, that uh, so so the uh, the the. Uh, Restrained geometry optimization was developed together with uh, Angela Roster of King's College of London, and uh, the uh, and uh, and also Ryan Steeler of University of Utah helped me with part of the um, plane energy initial um, plane energy scan code. And for the wave function analysis, the ESP charge and the RASP charges, and uh, so so I, I got help from Ying Zhang of New York University and uh, Shenlong Wan from Semi University, Sarma, uh, and uh, Chao Jin from HRPI was very closely involved in the respiratory charge fittings. And then for the decomposition of TDFT energy, that's mainly inspired by uh, Professor Dong Wok Kim from Kong University in Southern, uh, Southern Korea. And, uh, and for the QM frequency calculations, many people contributed, and this, uh, including Alex Sot, uh, a QCAM developer now at uh, National Institute of Child Health Diseases, Gerhard Koenig now at uh, Rutgers University, Tsinghua at Western Lake University, Yan Li from Eastern China National Normal University, and Bernard Brooks from AIH. And uh, so, uh, so many, so so I have a group here at the University of Oklahoma, and uh, they are trying all different things that I've mentioned uh, in this presentation. And uh, the development of the fast QMM frequency calculations was supported by Department of Energy, uh, National Institute of Health, and US, US Army. And some of my recent research is supported by University of Oklahoma. With that, I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Yihan, for that extremely informative talk. I'm sure we all um, got a lot out of it. I, I know I did. Um, we have a brief, a practical question from the audience here. Um, and I think uh, what, what, um, what they want to know is, 
for the analysis tools for TDDFT, such as generation of point charges and for an energy decomposition analysis, do those procedures affect the, uh, re the TDDFT results at all? No, no. The, 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 the short answer is no. The two charge analysis tools we have now, either Millikan charge or ESP charge analysis, is done after the TDDFT calculation is finished. So, so, so this is a post-calculation analysis. So you get you you. You finish the calculation, you get the, the amplitudes, and then from the amplitudes, you construct the transition density and different density. And actually, we need the relaxed different density. And from that, we, we, we compute the charge populations. Thank you, Han. Uh, I think that I answered it perfectly. Um, I, I know I, I have a question. Um, would, would you mind um, going to slide 10 or uh, slide 20? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Um, would Would you mind explaining uh, the ver the various energy terms that we get out of the EDA here? So uh, H, J1, K1. Uh, sorry to put you on the spot. Okay. Uh, so, so 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 the so if we come back here and to look at the definition with the Wilson term. So let me explain the Wilson term first. So the so so so. What we have here is a summation of the orbital energy difference and the amplitudes. And if we if we if we if we trans, if we convert the expression into the atomic basis, what we, that's what we typically do is to, it then this term will become the so-called the uh, difference density matrix, and this will become Fock matrix. So this term can be equally, uh, can be written uh, alternatively as the dot product of the different density matrix and the Fokker matrix. And the Fokker matrix has three contributions, the core Hamiltonian, the Coulomb matrix, and exchange matrix, and exchange correlation matrix. So it has four contributions. And uh, each, each of the, each of the Fokker matrix contribution and term will contribute to this G H, G1, K1, and uh, an extended correlation term. And then the two electron terms, I already explained that uh, the, 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 the Coulomb term is the self-interaction of the transition density. And then the, the exchange term comes from the interaction between the attachment and the attached Detachment and attachment density, or the whole density and, 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 and the particle density, and uh, so and using the current exchange operator. And the exchange, cor exchange correlation term is more complicated. It's related to the second functional derivative of the of the of the diff of the functional. Does that answer your question? That does. Thank you. So uh, it's the, the, the terms in the top line. Come from the Fock matrix. And That's the correct. Terms from the bottom line come from the uh, exchange correlation functional and the. the in, yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. So, so, in other words, this come from the transition density, and these two come from the. Uh, uh, sorry, this come from different density. This come from transition density. Thank you. Um, maybe what, one more quick question. Um, you told us about a few very uh, appealing sounding. Uh, point charge schemes, uh, CM5, iterative Hirschfeld, and the ESP charges you introduced, would you recommend one of those over the other? Um, or is there a particular situation where one of those is a better choice? So what I want to say is that we, in general, that we know what ones we shouldn't use. Right. When we, we should try to avoid over-interpret American charges. It's we shouldn't try to over, overuse Hertzfeld charges. And in general, that the other four, and actually other five, MBO, Chalk, G, CM5, iterative Hertzfelds, and my ESP charge implementation, they are all different. And uh, they all have different uh, shortcomings. And Chalk, G, and uh, ESP charges suffer from the 
under determination, namely that you, when you have a buried atoms, then the the charges of the buried atoms are underdetermined. But uh, but uh, but uh, but if you have small molecules, they might work the best. And iterative Hertz fields, I think they'll be good if we have if if we have a large molecule with buried atoms. But the problem there is that we don't have a legal gradient for iterative Hertz field, and probably even for we do have a legal gradient for Hertz field itself, but we don't have a legal gradient for iterative Hertz field. With same five charges, some people find that to be very useful, especially for computing the hydrogen free energies in the so by the MM community. And uh, in, so, so, but uh, but uh, but overall, that uh, but CM5 is not necessarily good for, for example, for for developing product of force fields. Because the because the uh, to go from Hertz field to same five they added classical corrections that classical correction does not change the, with the environment. Oh, great! That, that's, uh, there's that's no perfect charge to use. There's no perfect charge yeah. scheme. I, I'm sure. Okay. Well, well, thank you. With that, I'd like to thank Ihan again for, for his, uh, his excellent talk. Uh, I'd like to thank all the attendees for for listening. Um, so I look forward to our next webinar by the end of April. If you are new to QKM, you want to learn how to use QKM in general, you can also uh, check our website and click uh, instructional materials and uh, there are uh, tutorials and uh, practice sessions. You can learn some basic QKM calculations here. This concludes our webinar. We would like to thank Professor Yihan Xiao for his excellent presentation, as well as Dr. Adrian Morrison and Dr. Zhenting Gan for organizing, running, and moderating this webinar. Should you have any questions, please feel free to contact us by emailing either Zhenting or Evgeny at the email noted on your screen. We also invite you to visit us on Facebook. Thank you for your participation, and see you at the next webinar.